Hello, everybody. It is a pleasure and an honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Stan Lombardo. Stan grew up in New Orleans, where he earned his BA from Loyola University and an MA from Tulane. And after going to Texas to earn his PhD in classics from the University of Texas, uh, Stan joined the faculty of the Department of Classics at the University of Kansas, where he stayed until his retirement just a few years ago. At KU, Stan taught Latin and Greek language at all levels, as well as courses in ancient Greek and Roman culture. He was also chair of the classics department for 15 years and uh, stood at the helm of the honors program for five years. Stan was beloved by his students for his wit, his creativity, and his honesty. No matter the class, Stan brought poetry to it by paying attention to the beauty of languages. He would ask students to read aloud in Latin, Greek, or English. This was an activity that always opened their hearts and minds to the work. And when he read in whatever language, it was like a charm had come over the classroom. Over his career, Stan has translated many works of ancient and modern literature into vivid and accessible English. He has given us lively translations of ancient philosophy, including texts by Empedocles, Parmenides and Plato, uh, of epic poetry, notably Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, uh, and the great epics of Latin poetry, such as Virgil's Aeneid and Ovid's Metamorphoses, also Dante's masterwork in Italian, the Divine Comedy, and even the epic of Gilgamesh. And finally, Stan has rendered many works of Eastern wisdom into lovely English, such as Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching. In his translations, Stan always takes care that the result be sonorous as well as accurate. His translations beg to be heard rather than read. And for this reason, I am so glad uh, that he is with us today, where he will uh, read to us in English and with a little bit of Greek, Homer's story about Circe. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stan Lombardo. Thank you, Tara. I've been reading from book 10 of Homer's Odyssey. Some of you may be following along. I'll be starting uh, in book 10, line um, 206. Uh, Odysseus is uh, telling the story of his adventures to uh, Alcinous, uh, king the island of Phaeacia where he's being entertained. I would like to begin with the invocation to the muse, Homer's invocation to the muse at the very beginning of the Odyssey. I'll read that in Greek so we can hear what the Greek sounds like and, the, and then go right into uh, Odysseus's account uh, of uh, his encounter with Circe. Andra, Moyenape Musa, Polutrapon, Hosmalapola Prangle, Epe Troyes Hieran, Toliathron, a Perse, Holon Danthropon Idenastea, Kai no Onebno, Holodogen Ponto Patanalde, Hon Catathumon, Arnumenos, Hain Tebs, you came, Kai Noston Hitairon. Aludos heterus erusato, he am an osper. Alton gars peteris and a tastalies in Olonto, Nepioi. Hoi catabus superianos elioio estion. Ater hotois in a pelata, nostimanemar. Ton hamothen ge the athugater dios, epe kai hen. When dawn brushed the eastern sky with rose, I called my men together and spoke to them. Listen to me, men. It's been hard going. We don't know east from west right now, but we have to see if we have any good ideas left. We may not. I climbed up to a lookout point. We're on an island ringed by the endless sea. The land lies low. And I was able to see smoke rising up 
through brushy woods. This was too much for them. They remembered what Antiphates, the Lystragonian, had done and how the Cyclops had eaten their comrades. They wailed and cried, but it did them no good. I counted off the crew into two companies and appointed a leader for each. Eurylochus headed up one group and I took the other. And then we shook lots in a bronze helmet. Out jumped the lot of Eurylochus, brave heart. And so off he went with 22 men, all in tears, leaving us behind in no better mood. They went through the woods and found Circe's house in an upland clearing. It was built of polished stone and surrounded by mountain lions and wolves, creatures Circe had drugged and bewitched. These beasts did not attack my men, but stood on their hind legs and wagged their long tails like dogs fawning on their master who always brings treats for them when he comes home from a feast. So these clawed beasts were fawning around my men who were terrified all the same by the huge animals. While they stood like this in the gateway, they could hear Circe inside, singing in a lovely voice as she moved about, weaving a great tapestry, the unfading handiwork of an immortal goddess finely woven, shimmering with grace and light. Polites, a natural leader, and of all the crew, the one I loved and trusted most, spoke up then. Someone inside is weaving a great web and singing so beautifully the floor drums with the sound. Whether it's a goddess or a woman, let's call her out now. And so they called to her and she came out and flung open the bright doors and invited them in. They all filed in naively behind her, except Eurylochus who suspected a trap. When she had led them in and seated them, she brewed up a potion of Pramnian wine with cheese, barley and pale honey stirred in. And she laced this potion with insidious drugs that would make them forget their own native land. When they had eaten and drunk, she struck them with her wand and herded them into the styes outside, grunting, their bodies covered with bristles. They looked just like pigs, but their minds were intact. Once in the pens, they squealed with dismay and Circe threw them acorns and berries, the usual fare for wallowing swine. Eurylochus at once came back to the ship to tell us of our comrade's unseemly fate. But hard as he tried, he could not speak a word. The man was in shock. His eyes welled with tears and his mind was filled with images of horror. Finally, under our impatient questioning, he told us, how his men had been undone. We went through the woods, as you told us to glorious Odysseus and found a beautiful house in an upland clearing built of polished stone. Someone inside was working a great loom and singing in a high clear voice, some goddess or woman. And they called out to her. She came out and opened the bright doors and invited them in. They naively filed in behind her. But I stayed outside, suspecting a trap. And they all disappeared. Not one came back. I sat and watched for a long, long time. And not one came back. He spoke. And I threw my silver-studded sword around my shoulders, swung on my bow, and ordered Eurylochus to retrace his steps and lead me back there but he grabbed me by the knees and pleaded with me, wailing miserably. Oh, force me to go back there, leave me here, because I know that you will never come back yourself or bring back the others. Let's just get out of here with those that are left. We might still make it. 
Those were his words, and I answered him. All right, Eurylochus, you stay here by the ship. Get yourself something to eat and drink. I'm going though. We're in a really tight spot. And so I went up from the ship and the sea into the sacred woods. I was closing in on Circe's house with all its bewitchment when I was met by Hermes. He had a golden wand and looked like a young man, a hint of a mustache above his lip, youth at its most charming. He clasped my hand and said to me, where are you off to now, unlucky man, alone and in rough uncharted terrain? Those men of yours are up in Circe's house, penned like pigs into crowded little stars. And you've come to free them? I don't think so. You'll never return. You'll have to stay there too. Oh well, I will keep you out of harm's way. Take this herb with you when you go to Circe and it will protect you from her deadly tricks. She'll mix a potion and spike it with drugs, but she won't be able to cast her spell because you have a charm that works just as well. The one I'll give you and you'll be forewarned. When Circe strikes you with her magic wand, Draw your sharp sword from beside your thigh and rush at her with murder in your eye. She'll be afraid and invite you to bed. Don't turn her down. That's how you get your comrades freed and yourself well loved. But first make her swear by the gods above. She will not unsex you when you are nude or drain you of your manly fortitude. So saying, Hermes gave me the herb, pulling it out of the ground and showed it to me. It was all black at the root with a milk white flower. Moly, the gods call it. Hard for mortal men to dig up, but the gods can do anything. Hermes rose through the wooded island and up to Olympus. And I went on to Circe's house, brooding darkly on many things. I stood at the gates of the beautiful goddess's house and gave a shout. She heard me call and came out at once, opening the bright doors and inviting me in. I followed her inside, my heart pounding. She seated me on a beautiful chair of finely wrought silver and prepared me a drink in a golden cup, and with evil in her heart, she laced it with drugs. She gave me the cup and I drank it off, but it did not bewitch me. So she struck me with her wand and said, off to the sty with the rest of your friends. At this, I drew the sharp sword that hung by my thigh and lunged at Circe as if I meant to kill her. The goddess shrieked and running beneath my blade grabbed my knees and said to me wailing, who are you and where do you come from? What is your city and who are your parents? I am amazed that you drank this potion and are not bewitched. No other man has ever resisted this drug once it's passed his lips but you have a mind that cannot be beguiled. You must be Odysseus, the man of many wiles, who Quicksilver Hermes always said would come here in his swift black ship on his way back from Troy. Well then, sheath your sword and let's climb into my bed and tangle in love there so we may come to trust each other. She spoke and I answered her. Circe, how can you ask me to be gentle to you after you've turned my men into swine? And now you have me here and want to trick me into going to bed with you so that you can unman me when I am naked? No, goddess, I'm not getting into any bed with you 
unless you agree first to swear a solemn oath that you are not planning some new trouble for me. Those were my words. And she swore an oath at once not to do me any harm. And when she finished, I climbed into Circe's beautiful bed. Meanwhile, her serving women were busy. Four maidens who did all the housework, spirit women born of the springs and groves and of the sacred rivers that flowed to the sea. One of them brought rugs with a purple sheen and strewed them over chairs lined with fresh linen. Another drew silver tables up to the chairs and set golden baskets upon them. The third mixed honey-hearted wine in a silver bowl and set out golden cups. The fourth filled a cauldron with water and lit a great fire beneath it. And when the water was boiling in the glowing bronze, she set me in a tub and bathed me, mixing in water from the cauldron until it was just how I liked it, and pouring it over my head and shoulders until she washed from my limbs the weariness that had consumed my soul. When Circe had bathed me and rubbed me with rich olive oil and had thrown about me a beautiful cloak and tunic, she led me to the hall and had me sit on a silver studded chair, richly wrought and with a matching footstool. A maid poured water from a silver pitcher over a golden basin for me to wash my hands and then set up a polished table nearby. And the housekeeper, grave and dignified, set out bread and generous helpings from all the dishes she had. She told me to eat, but nothing appealed. I sat there with other thoughts occupying my mind and my mood was dark. When Circe noticed I was just sitting there depressed and not reaching out for food, she came up to me and spoke winged words. Why are you just sitting there, Odysseus, eating your heart out and not touching your food? Are you afraid of some other trip? You need not be. I have already sworn I will do you no harm. So she spoke and I answered her. Seriously, how could anyone bring himself, any decent man, to taste food and drink before seeing his comrades free. If you really want me to eat and drink, set my men free and let me see them. So I spoke and Circe went outside holding her wand and opened the sty and drove them out. They looked like swine, nine or 10 years old. They stood there before her and she went through them and smeared each one with another drug. The bristles they had grown after Circe had given them the poisonous drug all fell away and they became men again, younger than before, taller and far handsomer. They knew me and they clung to my hands and the house rang with their passionate sobbing. The goddess herself was moved to pity. Then she came to my side and said, son of Laertes in the line of Zeus, my wily Odysseus, go to your ship now down by the sea and haul it ashore. Then stow all the tackle and gear in caves and come back here with the rest of your crew. So she spoke and persuaded my heart. I went to the shore and found my crew there wailing and crying beside our sailing ship. When they saw me, they were like farmyard calves around a herd of cows returning to the yard. Now the calves bolt from their pens and went friskily around their mothers lowing and wooing. That's how my men thronged around me when they saw me coming. It was as if they had come home to their rugged Ithaca, 
and wailing miserably, they said to me. With you back, Zeus born, it's just as if we had returned to our native Ithaca. But tell us what happened to the rest of the crew. So they spoke and I answered them gently. First, let's haul our ship onto dry land and then stow all the tackle and gear in caves. Then I want all of you to come along with me so you can see your shipmates and Circe's house, eating and drinking all they could ever want. They heard what I said and quickly agreed. Eurylochus though, tried to hold them back, speaking to them these winged words. Why do you want to do this to yourselves? Go down to Circe's house. She will turn all of you into pigs, wolves, lions, and make you guard her house. Remember what the Cyclops did when our shipmates went into his lair? It was this reckless Odysseus who led them there. It was his fault they died. When Eurylochus said this, I considered drawing my long sword from where it hung by my thigh and lopping off his head, close kinsman though he was by marriage. But my crew talked me out of it, saying things like, by your leave, let's station this man here to guard the ship. It's for the rest of us, lead us on to the sacred house of Circe. And so the whole crew went up from the sea and Eurylochus did not stay behind with the ship, but went with us in mortal fear of my temper. Meanwhile, back in Circe's house, the goddess had my men bathed, rubbed down with oil and clothed in tunics and fleecy cloaks. We found them feasting well in her halls. When they recognized each other, they wept openly and their cries echoed throughout Circe's house. Then the shining goddess stood near me and said, listen to me now. I myself know all that you have suffered on the teeming sea and the losses on land at your enemy's hands. Now you must eat, drink wine and restore the spirit you had when you left your own native land, your rugged Ithaca. You're a skin and bones now, a hollow inside. All you can think of is your hard wandering, no joy in your heart, for you have indeed suffered many woes. She spoke and I took her words to heart. And so we sat there day after day for a year, feasting on abundant meat and sweet wine. But when a year had passed and the seasons turned and the moons waned and the long days were done, my trusty crew called me out and said, good God, man, at long last, remember your home. If it's heaven's will for you to be saved and return to your house and your own native land. They spoke and I saw what they meant. So all that long day until the sun went down, we sat feasting on meat and sweet red wine. When the sun set and darkness came on, my men lay down to sleep in the shadowy hall. But I went up to Circe's beautiful bed and touching her knees, I beseeched the goddess. Circe, Fulfill now the promise you made to send me home. I'm eager to be gone and so are my men who are wearing me out, sitting around whining and complaining whenever you happen not to be present. So I spoke and the shining goddess answered, son of Laertes in the line of Zeus, my wily Odysseus, you need not stay here in my house any longer than you wish. But there is another journey you must make first to the house of Hades and dread Persephone. 
to consult the ghost of Theban Tiresias, the blind prophet, whose mind is still strong. To him alone, Persephone has granted intelligence even after his death. The rest of the dead are flitting shadows. This broke my spirit. I sat on the bed and wept. I had no will to live, nor did I care if I ever saw the sunlight again. But when I had my fill of weeping and writhing, I looked at the goddess and said, and who will guide me on this journey, Circe? No man has ever sailed his black ship to Hades. And the goddess, shining, answered at once, son of Laertes in the line of Zeus, my wily Odysseus, do not worry about the pilot to guide your ship. Just set up the mast, spread the white sail, and sit yourself down. The north wind's breath will bear her onwards. But when your ship crosses the stream of ocean, you will see a shelving shore and Persephone's groves, tall poplars and willows that drop their fruit. Beach your ship there by ocean's deep eddies and go yourself to the dank house of Hades. There into Acheron flow Periphlegathon and Cocytus, a branch of the water sticks, and there is a rock where the two roaring rivers flow into one. At that spot, hero, gather yourself and do as I say. Dig an L-square pit and around it pour libation to all the dead, first with milk and honey and then with sweet wine and a third time with water. Then sprinkle barley and pray to the looming feeble death heads vowing sacrifice on Ithaca, a barren heifer, the herd's finest, and rich gifts on the altar, and to Tiresias alone, a great black ram. After these supplications to the spirits, slaughter a ram and a black ewe, turning their heads toward Erebus, turning yourself backward and leaning toward the streams of the river. Then many ghosts of the dead will come forth, call to your men to flay the slaughtered sheep and burn them as a sacrifice to the gods below, to mighty Hades and dread Persephone. You yourself draw your sharp sword and sit there, keeping the feeble death heads from the blood until you have questioned Tiresias. Then, and quickly, the great seer will come. He will tell you the route and how long it will take for you to reach home over the teeming deep. Dawn rose in gold as she finished speaking. Circe gave me a cloak and tunic to wear and the nymph slipped on a long silver robe shimmering in the light, cinched it at the waist with a golden belt and put a veil on her head. I went through the halls and roused my men, going up to each with words soft and sweet. Time to get up, no more sleeping late. We're on our way. Lady Circe has told me all. So I spoke and persuaded their heroes' hearts. But not even from Circe's house could I lead my men unscathed. One of the crew, Elpenor, the youngest, not much of a warrior, nor all that smart, had gone off to sleep apart from his shipmate, seeking the cool air on Circe's roof because he was heavy with wine. He heard the noise of his shipmates moving around and sprang up suddenly forgetting to go to the long ladder that led down from the roof. He fell head first, his head snapped at the spine. His soul went down to the house of Hades. As my men were heading out, I spoke to them. 
You think no doubt that you are going home, but Circe has plotted another course for us to the house of Hades and dread Persephone to consult the ghost of Theban Tiresias. This broke their hearts. They sat down right where they were and wept and tore their hair, but no good came of their lamentation. While we were on our way to our swift ship on the shore of the sea, weeping and crying, Circe had gone ahead and tethered a ram and a black ewe by our tarred ship. She had passed us by without our ever noticing. Who could see a god on the move against the god's will? That's the end of Odyssey, book 10. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Lombardo. Now we have a little time for question and answer. So as we mentioned at the beginning, if you would please put your questions into the chat box and uh, Sean Jones will monitor the, sh uh, the chat and ask questions of Dr. Lombardo. So, um, we are getting a lot of appreciation and I will turn it over now to uh, Sean Jones to uh, share questions. Thank you, Julie. Um, it looks like we do have one question from Kendra. She's asking, what advice do you have for those just beginning to learn about Homer's work? Well, uh, the first thing you should do is read the uh, Iliad and uh, the Odyssey. Um, the time frame is such that you should read the Iliad first, the Odysseus fought and the war at Troy, and the Odyssey is, to a large extent, the story of his return home uh, from Troy. Um, we're about in the uh, middle of the Odyssey, uh, where we just uh, finished, being about to, at the end of uh, book 10. Uh, I recommend um, either reading it out loud or listening uh, to it being read. So I, I have recorded uh, both the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's easily available on audible.com. The poem is meant to be performed. It's uh, meant to be uh, listened to. Uh, so if you do read it, uh, instead of listening to it, uh, read it out loud. Uh, try to uh, get into each character, uh, try to perform it, and the great poem will come alive to you and you'll have uh, an appreciation uh, for it uh, uh, much deeper than you would uh, simply reading it uh, silently. Uh, if you wanted to uh, read something about uh, Homer and about his Iliad and Odyssey, uh, my translations each have um, uh, wonderful introductions, uh, lengthy uh, introductions by uh, Sheila Murnahan, um, uh, who teaches at Penn. Uh, she not only did the introductions uh, to Iliad and Odyssey, she, uh, she actually um, was my advisor throughout the translation. I think I had uh, more than a thousand comments uh, from her uh, on the Iliad translation and almost as many uh, on the Odyssey. And, she actually came, uh, came to Lawrence uh, uh, to work with me uh, personally. Her introductions are splendid. And I think that's the first place to go um, to learn about, uh, about Homer to those introductions. So thank you for your question. And we have another from Casey. She asked, what sparked your initial interest in Greek and Roman culture? Um, I was an undergraduate at Loyola University in New Orleans, and I, I was in the honors program, and there was a requirement that you had to take either sociology or Homeric Greek. So you can imagine the committee that uh, worked that out when it obviously written a textbook on sociology and the other. <laughs> I uh, had a strong feeling that classical Greek should be part of any honor student's education. Um, 
So the course was based on uh, Homer's Odyssey. And we started to um, read uh, Homer after just a, a few weeks of introduction to the grammar and so forth. Um, one lesson was simply the first two lines of uh, the Odyssey. Andra moyene de mosa polutrapon hos malapula plante epe troyes hieron toliethron epersen. As soon as I heard those lines, uh, I became a, a devotee, I guess you could say. Um, and you know, poetry had always been you know, like the mainstream of my life ever since I was um, well, a freshman in high school. You know, I would read you know, Dylan Thomas and Richard Burton, uh, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and poems like that uh, out loud uh, while in a rocking chair at home. So, so I had some kind of preliminary training, I suppose you could say, <laughs> uh, something to predispose me uh, to Homer's verse. Uh, but that's what, uh, that's what got me started, uh, really. Um, the, the sound of the first two lines of the Odyssey. Uh, and uh, I just stayed with it and you know, got degrees in classical languages from Loyola and Tulane University and um, University of Texas, as Tara mentioned in her introduction. And it's been, it's been the mainstream of my life. Uh, Susie has a question. She asked, are you providing any online classes to the public? Uh, not um, in Greek. Um, I'm presenting online classes uh, on Zen, but that's a different part of my life. <laughs> um, you know, I've never been approached uh, to do that. Um, maybe I'll talk to Tara about um, doing that through the University of Kansas. Um, I'm not sure, but um, thanks for the idea uh, anyway. <laughs> I like the idea. <laughs> it's a good idea. Um, another question from Mike, uh, a question about translation. Does it make much difference which translation I read? And can you give me an example of some differences between translations? Yes, <laughs> makes a big difference. Uh, when I was at the University of Texas, we did an all-day reading, uh, both of Homer's Iliad and Homer's Odyssey. We began with the Iliad, and I was one of the readers. And we were trying to decide which translation to use. And the two translations that uh, sold the best were Richmond Lattimore's translation, which he did in the 1950s. It's a very literal line-for-line -line translation, very uh, accurate and uh, it is in verse, um, verse isn't all that good. Um, the other uh, was a Robert Fitzgerald's translation of the Odyssey, which um, had come out in um, the 60s. And um, the cast got together and we tried reading from Lattimore and I uh, said, this just isn't working. You know, we couldn't make it come alive. But Fitzgerald's translation worked much better. Uh, we kind of fell in love with it. And we decided to use Fitzgerald's translation. So the recording was done. It was aired as a fundraiser for the University of Texas. And after um, playing book one of the Iliad, there was a pause and you know, soliciting um, donations. And the uh, first caller simply said, you're not using Lattimore's translation. I'm not giving you a dime. Boom, slam the phone down. <laughs> so people become attached uh, to translations. Um, there are no really bad uh, translations. They are uh, all accurate and all in some way uh, readable. Um, but I'll just let the story I just told um, send the message. Yeah, it makes a difference, it makes a difference. All right, we have a question from Jesse who asks, have you traveled to this part of the world to visit places discussed in Homer's works? Yes, like most classicists, I, I've been to Greece and um, to a certain extent, I mean, Troy is a great tourist attraction, <laughs> the other uh, Greek islands and, and the mainland. 
Um, I haven't gone often, um, but uh, yeah, it was kind of a pilgrimage. Uh, and I, as soon as travel is possible again, I, I highly recommend uh, a trip uh, to Greece. You really can't go wrong. Um, they're, they're really set up for tourists and, um, or you can just do it completely on your own uh, as well. All right, Julie, I think that's the end of our Q&A. I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I'll turn things back over to you. Okay, thank you, Sean. I would like to thank Dr. Lombardo for today's program, Dr. Tara Welch and the KU Department of Classics, the National Endowment for the Arts and Arts Midwest for their support of the library's NEA Big Read and all of you who attended today. In both the chat window and the invitation email to today's event, you will find a link to an online evaluation form. We hope you'll take the time to share your thoughts with us on your experience this afternoon. Reread all of your comments and value your feedback as we plan new events. I also plan to uh, send all of the very favorable comments that you have shared in our chat with the speaker today. It looks like we had a lot of appreciation, Dr. Lombardo, for your most excellent presentation. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed myself. I really appreciate the invitation. Yes, uh, we were glad you were able to do this. We invite you to go to the library's event calendar to find other upcoming programs of interest. Big Read programs will be happening from now through February 21st. Find a list of all the events listed on www dot bigreadwichita.org. Most of this year's events will be held virtually. Wichita Public Library's next Big Read program is this Thursday, January 14th, when Professor Jody Simon from WSU will present From Circe to Sabrina, a talk about the portrayal of witches throughout history. And that program will be in the evening. Uh, I believe it is uh, either or 6.30 p.m. Please check our calendar for that. Thanks for joining us, and this will end today's presentation.